service in the season of Pentecost. Uh, the theme of the gospel this morning is humility and charity, the um, great values that Jesus taught the world. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn number 560. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. <coughs>
and from whom those secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. The theme of our gospel reading in the sermon today is, is three, three words. Um, the first word is serenity. Can you say serenity, boys and girls? Serenity. serenity. What does serenity mean? Any boys and girls know what is serenity? It means to be serene. What does serene mean? Calm. It means be calm, be cool. Turn to your neighbor and say, be cool. Be cool. Right. That's not physically cool, but metaphorically be cool, be calm, be serene. The second, the second uh, value in the sermon and the reading today is humility. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, be humble? Be humble. And the third value in today's reading is uh, charity, generosity. Turn to your neighbor and say, be generous. Song that we've done a bit lately. Uh, you know the actions, boys and girls. You know this one goes with, with Christ, with Christ. In my vessel, I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. Lucas, you have to help me, bro. I'm doing this for you. <laughs> this is for your age group, and you're the only one in it. <laughs> with, no one else enjoys this, do they? It's just for Lucas. We're just doing it for you, bro. With Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm, as we go sailing home. Your heart goes sailing, sailing home, sailing. You know it, right? Okay. So I, I can't believe you know the actions, I have to play the guitar. So you're on your own with the actions. Oh, Christ in my vessel, I can smile at the storm. Go on 
the sandy land. So this is also a song about being ready for the storms of life, so we can be serene when the storms come, because we've built our house upon the rock. And the rock is what? Hmm, Christ. But Christ told us the story about building our house on the rock. And he said that the rock is obedience to his word. When we do the words of Jesus and we're obedient to his teaching, to be serene, to be humble, and to be generous, then we're building our life on the rock of Christ's teaching. So don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't, that means the land that can get washed away in the storm. Don't build it too near the shore. If you're right next to the sea, you might get washed away by the high tide. Well, it might look kind of nice if you're perched on a cliff overlooking the ocean, but you'll have to build it twice. Yes, you'll have to build your house once more. And then the chorus of the second part goes, you better build your house upon a rock. Make a sure foundation on a solid spot. The storms may come and go, but the peace of God you will know. So let me just sing it for you and sing it with me. Um, we've lost the art of singing without words. We don't know how to sing without books and overhead projector. So this few occasions when we get to meet in Morrison, it takes us back to an older time when people remembered words and used their brains. John goes like this. Don't build your house on the sand.
through it together. Hold through it together. Let's slow it a bit more first. We're getting there. We're getting there. Don't build your house on the sand.
They're very simple, like the uh, other song of Christ. I am my beloved, and he is mine, and his banner over me is love. Come on, guys, help me out. Let's do the actions. I know it's warm, but uh, for the children. Welcome back, Miss Lucy. Lovely to see you again. Something new, so happy to see you. I am, I am my beloved, and he is mine, and his banner over me is love. I am my beloved, and he is mine, and his banner over me is love. I am my beloved, and he is mine, and his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. Now then, the men are going to sing, and the women are going to echo. He brought me to his banqueting table. No, no, no. You echo. He brought me to his banqueting table, okay? So the men are going to sing with me. He brought me to his banqueting table. 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 Together. And his banner. Like that. 
To listen carefully because it's so long. <laughs> I know, I looked at it last night. Okay, good morning. Good morning. good morning. good morning. The reading from the Old Testament, uh, Proverbs 25, verses 6 to 7. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Of a, of a noble. This is the word of the Lord. Got it? Get it? Got it? Good. Okay.
Okay, guys, let's join in the psalm, which is in your bulletin. And uh, I'm going to suggest that we continue our men-women theme this morning. Uh, if the men say the first verse and the women say the even verses, uh, we'll say it like that. So, gentlemen, please join with me as we begin Psalm 112, saying, Hallelujah! Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in His commandments. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. It is good for them to be generous in lending and to manage their affairs with justice. For they will never be shaken. The righteous will be happy in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is right. They put their trust in the Lord. Their heart is They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their heads with honor. The wicked will see it and be angry. They will not their teeth and find a way. The desires of the wicked will perish. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is read to us by Susie this morning. Thank you, Sue. Now, this uh, reading is not chosen to fit with the other readings, uh, but yet in the coincidence of God's economy, it does. Uh, good morning. Uh, today's epistle reading is taken from Hebrews uh, chapter 13, uh, 1 to 8 verse, uh, and also 15 to 16. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing, knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you, are, you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though, as though you, you, you yourself were being tortured. Let marriage be held in, the, in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge from, from fornicators and adulterers, adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susie. Let's stand and we'll sing our gradual hymn, uh, number 456, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. It's not Make Me a Chanel. Sorry, ladies. Make Me a Channel, 456. Also, you notice that it finishes on the verse, not the chorus, at the end. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's dark true faith in you. Oh, Master Grant, that I may never see so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke chapter 14 beginning at verse 1. Now in your uh, bulletin sheet you have verse 1 and then 7 to 14. So verses 2 to 6 are missing. So I'm going to put them in. The lectionary writer have taken it out to make it shorter for you because they think we like things shorter. So I'm going to put it back in because I think it ruins the story to take it out. So sorry you don't have it there but you can listen. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath day, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had edema. Edema means he was all swelled up with fluid, which means he had probably cancer or kidney disease or heart-lung disease, so he was dying, probably. And Jesus asked the experts in the law, that's the law of Moses and the Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people, to heal people on the Sabbath or not? And we discussed that last week, didn't we? Dr. Lindy was here and we established that being a doctor was work and that you have to pay when you go to the doctor and they weren't allowed to do work on the Sabbath. So Jesus says, is it lawful to heal people on the Sabbath? And the answer should be no, it's not lawful because it's work and they weren't allowed to work on the day of rest. But they were silent because they knew it was a loving and kind thing to do. And so Jesus took the man and healed him and sent him away. And then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox, a cow, that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. So then the story continues with your sheep. Then the same dinner, he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor. And he told them a parable, a story. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you will start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when the host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves, that's make themselves high up and great, will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He had also said to the one who had invited him, the host, when you give a lunch or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your sisters or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord, we pray that you will help us to grow in these three character traits of being calm and serene, being humble 
and being generous, showing charity. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, um, I need to test your memory if you were here last week. If you were not here last week, you're off the hook. But last week we heard the story about a woman who came to the synagogue when Jesus was there. And I told you it was the last time that he was invited to preach or to teach in the synagogue. The last time, because when he went to the synagogue, he kept healing people. And the religious leaders and authorities didn't like that because it was breaking one of the Ten Commandments. It was breaking the law of Moses. And um, there are many examples. There are about seven examples in the scripture of Jesus healing people on the Sabbath day. We find them in Luke, in Mark, and in John. All sorts of different diseases. Someone with a, a, a crippled hand, someone with a crippled leg. There was a lady who'd been bent over like this for 18 years. There was someone who was demonized. There were all sorts of people that Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. And last week we heard about the last occasion when that happened. Imagine if you're a woman and you're like this for 18 years. You can't look up, you can't look people in the face. You have to do your daily chores, walking around. How painful, humiliating it would be. And they would have considered her cursed by God. They would believe this was because of her sin or her parents' sin. So she would be socially outcast and she lived that way. And Jesus, uh, in the story before last week, had healed her in the synagogue. And the, the president of the synagogue was very unhappy, you remember. So can anybody remember, what were the two lessons, one of the two lessons from last Sunday? Yeah, thank you, Auntie Sal. People come first. That was the first lesson. In Jesus' ministry, people came before human systems of administration, human systems of government, they, uh, people came before ideologies uh, and even before the law of God because uh, it was a deeper law, the law of love. People come first. Jesus loved people first. And what was the second thing we learned last week? Help immediately. Help promptly. You guys are great. When you're going to help, do it quickly. Jesus helped them immediately. And we see that in today's story as well. So now we come to today's story. And in today's story... We have another occasion on a Sabbath. Maybe it's the same day in the evening. Maybe he's been to synagogue in the morning and that evening. A leader of the Pharisees invite him to eat a meal. Now this is well on in the ministry of Jesus. And he's already on many occasions been healing people in the synagogues. So I think that... It doesn't say this in the story, but there's a hint. I think it's a trap. I'll tell you why I think it's a trap. Because it says in your, in your gospel sheet there that it was the Sabbath, that it was the house of a leader of the Pharisees. So this is an important person. And he's invited the young rabbi that everybody loves to his house, the young rabbi who's known to be healing people on the Sabbath. And it says they were watching him closely. Now, the, the word in the Greek, to watch closely, means to spy or to do espionage with sinister intent. Sinister means evil, okay? So they're spying on him with sinister intent. Now that's a clue. Okay, so this is not just a dinner party. This is a trap. This is a dinner party with a trap. And at this dinner party, there's a man who has a condition which the King James Bible used to call dropsy. And dropsy means edema. It means he's swollen. Maybe he has cancer in his liver or, or kidneys and his tummy is swollen up. Or maybe he has a heart disease, his heart is failing, and he can't pump the fluid, and he's got club feet, his legs are full of fluid or something. We don't know. But he had this bad edema. It must have been quite a miracle to watch. Because if Jesus healed him, the edema, the swelling of fluid, must have gone... <laughs> you, you get it? You know, I, I had a friend in school who was not a Christian, and he went once to a Pentecostal meeting. And they were praying for people, and there was someone came up with one leg longer than the other. My friend Michael was very clever. He went on to be a doctor, actually, later. Um, but he, he was very clever. He wasn't yet a Christian, but he was searching for God. And at this meeting, they got this person up with one leg, was like limping short, longer than the other. And they put them down with their feet on the chair, and they prayed for them. And Michael came to school the next day, not a Christian. And he told everybody at school, man, it was so amazing. I saw his leg go, yoop. Now, this is not a Christian guy. He actually didn't become a Christian. But he began to believe there was a God. Because he, saw, he said, I, and he told all his mates at school, all his non-Christian mates. It's like, oh, I was really amazing, guys. 
I, I was there and I saw it, and his leg went zoom. He, he saw it before his eyes. So I think this must have been a dramatic miracle. This guy had a swollen tummy or swollen legs or swollen something, hands or something, had edema, and Jesus healed him. It means all that fluid went and disappeared. And you know, it's interesting because it, it says, you don't have it there, but it says in the, in the scripture, when, um, when the man who has edema is, comes in front of Jesus, Jesus they're, they're, it's a trap for Jesus because they want to see, is he going to heal him like he did with the other, the, all the other people, the other six people? Because if Jesus heals him, then they can accuse him. Now they have the, it's hosted by the chief Pharisee and they have all the big, the big guns there. And they could say, well, now we've seen it for ourselves. It's not hearsay. We've seen you heal on the Sabbath. You're breaking the law. You can't be a man of God. You know, stone him. You know, it must be, he must not be godly. It's not from God. Because Jesus was a puzzle for them. Because he could heal people like a prophet, but he broke the Ten Commandments, like this commandment. Because he put loving people first. So they didn't know what to do with him, what to make of him. So what Jesus does is he confronts the question first. He, he knows what's in their mind. And he says to them, is it lawful to heal people on the Sabbath? So before they can accuse him of breaking the law, he asks them the law. And what do they say? They say nothing. Because, he, in other words, he flips the trap. He traps them. You get it? Because if they say, oh, it's not lawful to heal, then he can say, then why do you rescue your child when she falls in a well? Or why do you rescue your donkey when he falls in a hole? Um, or why do you do this or that? Why are you hypocrites? You know? And this is a, a person who needs healing. So they, they stay silent. because, And also it won't be popular with the crowd. If they say, oh no, it's not lawful to heal. The crowd will be angry with them. And they will lose public relations. They will lose popularity. So when Jesus says, can I heal on the Sabbath? They say nothing. Now do you see the genius of that? Because then when he does heal on the Sabbath, what can they say? Nothing. They can't criticize him or attack him. Their mouth is shut because they had their chance. He, he, said, he could say, well, I asked you if it was unlawful and you didn't say anything. So it must be okay, right? And, and, so, and it's interesting the way he does it. Did you notice how promptly he does it? It says, he took him, healed him, and what? Sent him away. Bang, wham, bang, bang, like that. Took him, healed him, off you go. Now, okay, he was putting into practice what he taught us last week. If you're going to help, help them promptly. But he does something else. He sends him away. Why does he do that, do you think? I mean, it's Exhibit A, right? It's Exhibit A. It's just healed him. It shows the power of God. Why does he send the man out at the dinner? Sends him away. Is it a loving environment? Do they care about the man? No. It's a toxic. They're snakes. It's a toxic environment. They're there to trap Jesus. Later on, we read after the, after the resurrection that, that Peter heals the man by, by, by the gate in Jerusalem. And, he, and they get called up before, before the parliament and, and accused, you know, by what power, by what authority do you do these things, you know? And then the man who's been healed, he also gets called up in parliament, so he gets in trouble. So it's pretty scary for a humble person, you know, to be in front of the illegal authorities. So Jesus protects him by getting him out of there. And then he can't, they can't say, oh, what was his name? Who is that guy? We have to prosecute him. He was healed on the Sabbath. You know, he was party. He was a party to the breaking of the law of Moses. That was a serious crime to break the law of Moses in Jewish understanding. So Jesus protects him. He loves him physically, and he loves him by protecting him from the toxic atmosphere there. And then he says to them, he points out their hypocrisy. You guys, if your child fell in the well, you would pull them out on the Sabbath day. And then they can't say anything. So he's turned the trap on them. And, and so the first lesson, boys and girls, that I learned from this story is be cool. Because, you know, if someone trapped me, if I get trapped or attacked, or I'm in a toxic meeting with people that are, are antagonistic towards me, uh, my wife can tell you, you know, I get stressed and I get uptight and I get upset and I come home and say, oh, that was so stressful and these people did this, you know. And she, you know, she's always very calm. So. Many of you are much better at serenity than I am. Serenity is one of my weaknesses. So, but in this story, you can see the serenity of Jesus. He's cool. He has the wisdom of God. He knows he can see the trap coming. He turns the tables on them. 
He heals the man, he protects the man and gets him out of there, and then he teaches them a lesson. So he, he's cool. But there's something else about it, and that is that he cares about them. Because he goes to the house of someone who appears to be his enemy. Now, if my enemy invites me for dinner, I'm not sure I want to go. If my enemy is setting a trap to get me in trouble, do I want to go and be with those people for dinner? I would just say, Crystal, you know, let's, let's not go to this. You know, we don't want to go to this. You know? But Jesus goes. Now, what that tells me is that he has hope for humanity. Because even though these guys are so toxic and they're so, such legalists, they want to do the right thing. Their motive is somehow not altogether wrong. They want to keep the law of God. They just don't understand that there's a deeper law, the law of love. And so Jesus' action in keeping cool, going to the dinner, expresses hope for me and for you. He doesn't give up on them because they're enemies. So if an enemy invites you for dinner, the thing is not necessarily to say no, I mean you need wisdom about that, but it's maybe to go prayerfully and with wisdom, knowing that it, there may be a trap or there may be something bad about it. But Jesus goes and he tries to win them over. You know, he, he tries to say, hey guys, if your child fell in the hole, you wouldn't pull them out on the Sabbath. Love trumps law, right? Love, the love of God, love of, of charity, of caring for the needy. I'm not talking about romantic love. That doesn't trump anything. But the love of God for one another, that, that, trumps, that trumps legalism. And, and so, so this first part of the story, turn to your neighbor and say, be cool. Be serene. Now, guys, boys and girls, boys and girls, when you're in trouble, when you're in trouble and you're being calm, what underlies that? What's the foundation of that? How, why are you able to be calm, Matt, when you're facing the storm? You have faith in Christ who's with you. So, guys, the foundation of serenity is faith. When you're like me, and you're not a very serene person, as Christopher can tell you, always listening to my whinging, then actually it's an expression of, of disbelief. If we trust God, we will be calm in the face of opposition. We will, you know, Jesus said you'll have opposition in this world. You'll have trouble. We should expect it. All Christians are running around in circles like chickens because the world is becoming more secular and, and we're losing the control that we, we've had in the past of, of things like marriage and civil values and so on. But this is just the way of the world. So we shouldn't be running around and saying, oh, you know, um, the world's becoming more liberal and more sinful. We just need to be who God has called us to be and to live our faith in the world. Be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus called us to be. So the first thing is be cool. Turn to your neighbor, say be cool. Be cool. Be cool because Jesus is with you in your heart. The second lesson in the story, um, the second lesson, second lesson in the story, uh, is this, the lesson of, of being humble. Turn to your neighbor and say, be humble. be humble. Now, in the ancient world, in the ancient world, being humble was not cool. In the ancient world, humility was not a value that people had. So, for example, the Greeks would write on stone the, their values, their moral values. Nowhere in the Greek world, on all the Greek temples, nowhere does it say, be humble. It was not a Greek value. In fact, it was considered good in the Greek and Roman world to be proud. You would, you know, if you were powerful and influential and clever, you would show it off to people. Nobody thought you should be humble. It wasn't part of the world. Today, um, chief executives who study MBAs are taught the importance of humility and wandering around the shop floor and helping the workers on the floor and listening to people and, and being humble leaders. Is that right, Uncle Tony? Pretty much to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the endorsement. So, um, I mean, I've heard people on, on uh, you know, these TED Talks talk about the importance and business of humility among leaders. So, in our world today, we expect governors, presidents, we, they, now, are they humble? No. But we, we hate them when they're not. You know, when we see governors and presidents and leaders who are arrogant, do we like them? No. But when we see leaders who are, who are truly humble, you know, like Queen Elizabeth, you know, she's a pretty humble person. 
and people respect her for it, you know? And, and when Mr. Trump patronizes her and steers her and puts his arm around her, you know, she, she could turn around and smack him in the face. I mean, she, she's a living history. She's a living legend, right? I mean, she's entertained prime ministers and presidents for 100 years. And, and who is he, you know? Um, and, uh, and yet she's very humble. She's just very gracious. And um, so we respect leaders who, who are humble. Where does it come from? It comes from Jesus. And it comes from readings like this reading today. So Jesus says, when you go to a party, don't make yourself you know, big and great and sit up front and get all the glory for yourself, but sit down the bottom and, and let the host come and say, come up higher. And he says, uh, if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. God will lift you up. If you lift yourself up, you're going to be humble before God and before others. So the second thing is be humble. We respect people who leaders who are, are humble and as Christians we're called to be humble. The third thing, the third principle today in the reading is charity. He said to the one who invited him, when you give lunch or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your sisters or your relatives or your rich neighbors. And then they says a terrible thing, in case they invite you in return, wouldn't that be terrible? And you would be repaid. Shock, horror. So he says, don't just invite the people who love you. Don't just invite your family. Because they will just invite you back and you'll have your happy little clique of all your little friends. But look for the pe person who has no friends. Look for the person who is outcast. Look for the person who is crippled, lame, poor, socially unacceptable, blind or needy or whatever it is. And Jesus says, you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus says, when you, um, when you are generous with your loved ones, include the poor and the needy. Um, and be generous with them too uh, uh, because then they can't pay you back. So you see, when we give, very often we give because we want to get something back. You know, we give to help someone in the hopes that they'll help us at some point, in some way. Um, or maybe we give because we want to be proud and show that we are a generous person. And so Jesus is teaching us here that, that there's only one motive for giving. And, and that is love, pure love with no strings attached. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, no strings? So Jesus is telling them, if you have strings attached, Jesus is saying, oh, that's terrible. He's saying, you know, it would be terrible if you invite people who love you, then, then you will be repaid. They may invite you in return. Shock, horror. You know, he's, he's expressing it like it's a bad thing. We think it's a normal good thing. But he's saying, no, that's a bad thing. Because if you get blessed back by your friends, you get no reward in heaven. But he says, if you bless people who can't bless you, if you help people who can't help you, then your reward is in heaven. So we should love, Jesus is telling us to love with no strings attached. Now again, this was crazy in the time of Jesus. This was just nuts. Nobody lived like this. Nobody uh, thought that, that they should um, have faith in God in this way and be well, maybe they did think of being serene. Um, but nobody thought about humility or about helping the poor and the needy. It just made no sense to Greeks and Romans. And so our world has changed dramatically because of this gospel reading. And people say, oh, the Bible is not relevant anymore. They, they don't understand that they're living their lives, their values, that they just think are normal, come from Jesus. And here today in this reading, we have three of them. Be calm by faith. Be, have, a, have a serenity. When, when you're in the vessel, in the boat, in the storm, be calm because Christ is in the vessel. Be wise. You know, God will give you the wisdom to deal with the toxic uh, enemies and the snakes in the world. Be serene. And number two, be humble. Don't put yourself up. Don't exalt yourself. Let someone else put you up and defend you and exalt you. Um, and don't be surprised when you get attacked. I'm always surprised when I get attacked. It's like, well, what did I do? But actually, Jesus said we, we will be attacked in this life. And, and thirdly, um, help those who can't help you. Be, be, be generous. It, do charity. So let's close. What are the three words? Number one, cool. serenity. Be cool. Be cool. Turn to your neighbor say, be cool. Be cool. Number two, be humble. be humble. And number three, be generous, be generous, with, with no strings attached, okay? So boys and girls, this is the lesson today. I hope you learned something. Did you learn anything? Yeah. Oh, you guys are so kind, thank you. <laughs> Troy, did you learn anything? You've heard it all before, right? What did you learn today?
be generous. But you knew that already, right? So you didn't need to come to church. <laughs> but you need to come to church to eat the morning tea. No, me too, bro. That's it. Okay, just teasing. Okay, thank you all. All right, uh, we're going to turn to our prayers now. And who's leading our prayers today, on? Oh, Auntie Sal. Thank you, Auntie Sal. Would you lead us? Let us pray for the world and for the church throughout the world. Thank you, friends. Our response today is, Lord, have mercy, hear our prayer. Creator, Lord, we thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for you are the source of all goodness. You are the light that guides us. Your glory reaches down from heaven to touch and comfort us. You are the provider who sustains and nourishes us. You watch over us and your presence is with us always and we thank you. Father, we pray for your church that we may stand firm in your word with humility, charity, and serenity and with a willingness to obey. Examine our hearts, Lord, soften the heart spots and strengthen the weak. Help us to fix our gaze on Christ, putting others first and serving them to exemplify the Father's love for us. We lift up those in our neighbor, beginning with those who follow you. Shine your light on us that we may reflect your God's goodness to others. Let us be salt and light, pointing others to you. Guard our hearts and hypocrisy from hypocrisy. Guard our hearts from hypocrisy and temptations and raise up leaders who will faithfully serve you. Grant us the boldness to magnify your name and your kingdom. We pray for your protection and guidance over educators and students as school resumes. Embrace them with your love and allow them to experience your presence in the many blessings you put before them. We pray for all those in authority and leadership both locally and throughout the world. Give them your wisdom and surround them with godly counselors who will exercise integrity and work for justice. We pray for an end to war around the world, especially those in Burma, Afghanistan, Russia, and the Ukraine. Sorry. We, we pray for the lost and her, no, her, the hurting, the lonely, the sick, the bereaved, the bereaved and those who are imprisoned behind both visible and invisible walls send your comfort your peace and your calming presence to those who are without hope protect the defenseless and hold them close to your heart we pray for missionaries to tell the good news of jesus to people around our world make them brave and give them the power protection find the power of satan and strength of believers everywhere so many needs jesus but you're adequate for every need your name is powerful and your power is great so it's in your name that we pray and believe lord have mercy hear yeah. our Amen. prayer Amen. Amen. as we prepare our hearts uh, for communion uh, friends uh, hear the reminder that Jesus said you shall love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first commandment, and the second commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> on, the, <coughs> on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We turn to page six in the Greek prayer book as we confess our sin. We say together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Friends, hear these words of forgiveness and absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. May we stand for the greeting of peace.
Well, welcome back, and the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another with the shalom, the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Shalom, peace be with you. Peace be with you, Mary. Number 162, uh, The Servant King, From Heaven You Came, 162. I, I love this spirit of fellowship and joy that there is here. It's really wonderful, guys. It's great to be with you all. From heaven you came, helpless babe. And said I was your glory then, not to be served, but to serve. And give your life that we might live. This is our love, the servant king. He calls us now. 
meditate in the green treble. Let us ascribe to the Lord the honour due his name as we bring our offerings and come into his courts. We pray together this offering prayer. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you. And of your own do we give you. Is Lucas still here with us? Oh, so in honour of Lucas being here, we're going to have the short version of the communion prayer. So if you can turn to page 10, halfway down. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we pray together in unison. We, we celebrate, celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, thanksgiving. recalling his death, his resurrection, and ascension, we, we offer you these gifts. gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. We turn to page 22, and as our Savior Christ taught his disciples, we are confident to pray this family prayer, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, we will all share in one bread. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercy. We are not really so much as to gather all the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And let us feed on him in our heart by faith, with thanksgiving. If you have guests with you today who are not baptized, if you can please explain that if you are baptized and believe in Christ, you are welcome to receive communion with us uh, today. If you are not baptized, you are welcome to come for a blessing.
Dear friends, let us turn to the Thanksgiving prayer on page 25. As we give thanks for these mysteries we have received, we remember the word of the Lord to us this morning in the reading. Through Christ, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips that confess His name. And let us not neglect to do good and to share what we have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We give thanks as we pray together the prayer on page 25, saying, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son and Savior. And you have fed us with spiritual fruit in the sacrament of His body and blood. Send us now into the world of peace. We grant us strength and courage, love and serve you, and gladness and singleness of heart. And the blessing unto God's gracious mercy and protection, I commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Um, thank you, dear friends. I'd like to just say a thank you for... Many of you who have uh, come today, even though it's very hot, and obviously there's a few children, and last week because the Foods family not here, but I, I think also it's just it's, it's very hot for people. But we still have the same number of people as last week at this service. So thank you for coming and for supporting our worship. It's really joyful and wonderful to see you all here, uh, and to see uh, Liana brought her friend back today, and welcome to the, her as well. I've forgotten her name. Rosa. Roselle, let's welcome Roselle. Love you, thank you, Roselle. Welcome, Robert Darling. Come two weeks in a row, that's lovely. And welcome back to all of you. May we uh, sing our uh, closing hymn, which is number 857, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. 857 in your hymn book. I'm the Lord of sea and sky.
nature. We're going to exit through the front but on the left. Hallelujah. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.